Um, all right, so, so what I'm going to um, do today is, as you can see from, from my first slide here, is talk about two seemingly completely unrelated topics, and that's nuclear architecture and, and human aging. Um, and this is one of these um, examples of what sometimes happens in science, which is quite remarkable, that people find two completely different topics, and there's a connection made by a single observation, which then usually changes how we think about a particular problem uh, completely. Um, and this is an example of that, and it, because this happened a few years ago in the field of aging. Um, and, and what essentially happened was that a gene which is really important for nuclear architecture, mutations in that gene, was, uh, were identified as being important or being causal for a particular premature aging disease. And this has really, I think, changed the way we think about uh, aging. Um, and much of what I'm going to talk about really addresses the issue of, well, what, what really happens in this disease? What really goes wrong in this disease? <coughs> but there, there are two sort of larger points that I, I want you to pay attention to throughout the talk, uh, because I think this example makes this, these points very strongly. And one, the first one is that it's becoming clear that if you really want to understand a disease, you really need to understand the molecular and cell biology of the disease. Okay? Because that's the only way you can, you can devise proper diagnostic methods, and that's the only way you can really devise proper therapeutic approaches that really target the disease. So, so studying diseases at the molecular and cellular level is incredibly important. But I also want to make the reverse point um, and that is that by studying disease systems, disease cells, you actually learn a great deal about basic biology, basic molecular um, events. So it goes both ways. And so I think anyone who's interested in any sort of basic event um, should actually study disease cells because I think they tell you a lot about basic cell biology and molecular biology. Okay? So, when we first started with this, uh, my lab really wasn't interested in aging at all. Um, one of the reasons, of course, was that was a few years ago before I had gray hairs. And so that's all changed now. So we have an increasing interest in aging. Um, but the, the question that, that we're really interested in in the lab generally is, is sort of a more general one. It's a bigger one, um, in a way, a much more fundamental one. And that is, how does a genome actually function inside of a cell nucleus? Um, and this is really, a, a, I think, a very big question. Um, and I just want to illustrate that with, with a few numbers. So typically, you have about 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. It's a diploid genome. Um, and that means that uh, you have about 2 meters of DNA. And unfortunately, the cell nucleus, where the genome is packed, um, is only about 10 micrometers in diameter. Okay? If you think about this in slightly uh, other numbers, um, if you assume about 5 trillion cells per person, that means you have about 10 trillion meters of DNA in a human body. Okay? So that seems like a big number. Just to give you an impression of, of how big that number is, that's about 100 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. So that's how much DNA is packed into a single human body. Okay? So clearly, we have a problem here. Right? We have a packaging problem of how do you pack this DNA into the nucleus and how do you pack this DNA into a nucleus that actually functions, right? So that you can actually get the right transcription factors to the right genes at the right time and so on. So this is a very, very fundamental uh, problem. Now, part of the answer is probably that things inside of the, of the cell nucleus are, are highly organized. There, there's a lot of order. There's a lot of compartmentalization within the cell nucleus. And this is something that's really become clear over the last 10 years or so. Uh, by work from a large number of labs. Um, and we've learned a, a few very sort of key pieces of information. So for example, we've learned that there are architectural elements within the cell nucleus. So these are essentially proteins, particularly lamin proteins, which I'll talk about more, uh, which organize things inside of the cell nucleus. But there's, for example, also actin inside of the nucleus. And there's probably other proteins that uh, we don't even know yet which have structural uh, roles within the cell nucleus. So they're sort of a, a scaffold within the nucleus. 
Then we know that there's a large, no, large number of distinct compartments within the cell nucleus. So these are essentially uh, subnuclear bodies, subnuclear domains where different nuclear functions happen. And the best characterized uh, of those uh, is the nucleolus where you make ribosomal RNA. Okay, so you're probably all familiar with that, but there's a large number of other bodies, such as Cajal bodies, PML bodies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, within the nucleus. And so the bottom line here is that different things, different functions happen in different places inside a cell nucleus. So you're organizing um, both the genome and the machinery that reads the genome inside of the nucleus. Um, one of the, the, I think, most intriguing concepts that, that has emerged over the last few years is this idea that genomes are actually non-randomly organized within the cell nucleus. So it turns out that some chromosomes like to be, for example, in the center of the nucleus, and other chromosomes like to be at the periphery of the nucleus. And the same is true for genes. Some genes like to, to associate with the periphery, others with the interior. Some um, genes like to associate with some of these nuclear bodies, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of let's say, confusion in the field about what these positions actually mean. And w we don't know all the answers at this point, but it's a very active area of research, and, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that um, in the future. And then finally, um, we did a lot of work uh, early on when I first started my lab on dynamics inside of the nucleus, because it turns out that just about anything that happens within this nucleus is extremely dynamic. Uh, so proteins move around very rapidly within the nucleus, and these nuclear bodies actually move around as well. Um, and so this really adds another layer of, of complexity to this whole system, but it also adds another layer of possible regulation to this system. Um, and so we, we need to think about dynamics when we think about nuclear processes. So these are some of the concepts that, that have emerged over the last few years um, that I think at least partially explain how uh, the genome actually functions inside of the cell nucleus. So it's important to point out that this is not just all sort of pretty cell biology and pretty pictures. Uh, this is actually pretty important stuff because it turns out that how the nucleus is organi organized and changes in this organization um, have been implicated in just about any biological process you can think of. Um, particular differentiation, uh, particularly stem cell differentiation, um, but as I will tell you, it's also very important for various diseases, um, and it's also very important for biotechnical, uh, biotechnological applications and for clinical applications. Uh, because, for example, just, just to give you one example, if you're thinking about gene therapy, well, it might actually matter where in the nucleus your, your uh, integrated gene goes, uh, because it's not a homogeneous environment. Different parts of the nucleus are very, very different. So all of this is, is really quite important for just about any biological event. And the one I want to focus on today uh, is this one here, is this arrow uh, between nuclear architecture and uh, human aging. Now, aging is uh, a sort of interesting biological process because it's one of these events that, that you know, we're all interested in, obviously. Um, but we actually, we know extremely little about it at, at a molecular level. And part of, uh, part of why we don't know um, about the molecular mechanisms of aging is, is really the fact that for many, many years, people sort of said, you know, you can't really study aging at the molecular level because there's nothing to study. Uh, it's not, there's not like a program, there's not a mechanism. You know, it's just sort of wear and tear. Things just sort of go wrong as you age. So there's nothing to study. And that all changed um, about 15, 20 years ago when people started doing experiments mostly in worms and in flies doing genetic experiments and actually showing that you can get mutations which prolong lifespan, okay? Which means you've now interfered with essentially the aging process, the longevity process. And that, of course, then means that, well, there are genetics, there are pathways you can go and study. And people have done that, of course, and They've come up with all sorts of interesting pathways which they've proposed contribute to aging. Uh, and this, this ranges um, from things like protein degradation um, to, uh, that people have proposed to be important for aging, uh, various signaling events, uh, DNA damage, senescence, et cetera, et cetera. So, and it, actually, if you go into the literature, if you go into PubMed and you punch in aging plus any biological process you've ever heard of, you'll actually probably find a publication, okay? 
And, and that's actually a little bit of a problem because it, you know, it, it's hard to know what's actually real in the aging field. Um, and I think part of the reason why so many very different pathways have been implicated in aging is because a lot of the work was done in, in model systems. Um, as I said, the pioneering work uh, really was done in worms and flies and yeast and has then exte been extended to mouse. But of course, the question here is, well, you know, is, does yeast or a worm, do they age like humans do? Okay, can we just extend these findings to human aging? And again, the, pr the problem with addressing that question is, well, how do you do that experimentally? You can't go and do experiments on humans generally, right? Um, so, so it's been very, very difficult to actually study human aging. And one way, uh, one interesting way you could do that is by looking at premature aging diseases, which naturally occur in the population. And there's six diseases which, have, uh, which are generally considered premature aging diseases. And, and I won't say much about these. Most of these are actually DNA repair diseases. They have something to do with DNA repair. What's interesting from our point of view is that they all affect processes in the cell nucleus. Okay, now th this doesn't mean that all of aging happens in the nucleus in that sense. Okay, so there's very good evidence that mitochondrial function, for example, is, is implicated or is important for, for aging. Uh, but it is interesting that all known premature aging diseases in humans have something to do with the cell nucleus. So if you really want to know about the molecular biology of aging, if you go into the nucleus and look there, it's probably not a bad idea. Now, the, the clearest connection between nuclear architecture per se uh, and aging came from the observation in this disease here, uh, which is called hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome. And this is the, the event that I referred to at the very beginning of my talk, which really sort of changed the way uh, we've been thinking about nuclear architecture. And so, I, so I'm going to talk about this disease for, for the rest of my talk. So uh, just very briefly about this disease. Uh, this is a very, very rare premature aging disease. Um, it has a very early disease onset, typically about 6 to 12 months. Uh, so so the, the patients are actually at birth perfectly normal. You can't tell them apart. Um, but, but after about 6 or 12 months, they, they stop uh, their development or slow down their development. And you start seeing uh, early symptoms. Life expectancy in the disease is, is very, very short, uh, typically between 10 and 15 years. The symptoms um, are pretty obvious. Uh, when you look at, at these patients, uh, they have skin defects, um, they have loss of hair, they have bone loss. Um, also very important, they lose their subcutaneous fat completely, uh, again, as you can see in these pictures. But most importantly, they have um, um, uh, heart problems. They have atherosclerosis and cardiovascular defects. And, and those defects are actually the cause of death, invariably, in the patients. So these patients generally die of stroke, uh, typically uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 years of age. Okay? Now, the link to nuclear architecture comes from the finding um, that this disease is caused by a spontaneous point mutation in the lamin AC gene. So let me tell you a little bit about lamin AC. Oh, sorry about that. There's, there's something missing here. Anyway, so, the, so lamin, uh, lamins are major architectural um, uh, proteins of the cell nucleus. Okay? So they're intermediate filament proteins. And uh, here they're depicted in, in yellow. And what they essentially do is, is form a, a meshwork of protein underneath the nuclear envelope. Okay? And traditionally, the idea has been that this is mostly for mechanical purposes. So these, this meshwork of proteins uh, essentially supports the nuclear membrane, makes sure it's nice and round, and probably protects it from uh, mechanical stress from the outside, from the cytoplasm. Now, over the last few years, it's become clear that uh, lamins probably do a lot more. Uh, particularly, they seem to be important um, in, in gene expression. So for example, um, there is evidence that particular regions of the genome can actually be actively tethered to the lamins, so they physically interact um, with the lamina. So you, you would essentially take a gene and you would pull it to the periphery, and there is the idea that when you do that, um, you actually silence the gene generally. Okay? So there is the idea that these lamins are, are critically important for gene expression. 
Uh, there's also the idea that this essentially establishes a platform inside of the cell nucleus, particularly for signaling events. So for example, that signaling molecules associate with this uh, scaffold, similar to what happens in the cytoplasm, where, where signaling molecules sometimes associate with the cytoskeleton. And depending on this association, then th this changes the activity of, of these signaling molecules. Uh, there's also this idea, which there's, there's fairly little evidence, but I'll come back to it uh, for, for, uh, in a little while, that this essentially, uh, that the lamina can also provide a platform to sequester factors. So essentially to control the concentration of free, for example, transcription factors. Okay, so that you have a transcription factor which floats around and, for example, you, you modify it post-translationally, it then binds to the lamina and is essentially sequestered, which means it's not floating around anymore, it's not available to act on its genes. And then I'll come back to that. Okay, so the, the lamina is, is, is a very multifunctional uh, structure now. Now, in terms of human disease, it's... The laminase gene is a very interesting gene because mutations in this gene do not only cause this premature aging disorder, mutations in this gene also cause a whole range of other um, human disorders. And this is very, very unique. This is very special because usually when you have a large number of mutations in a particular gene, you always get the same disease, right? If you have a mutation in P53 or RB or whatever, it's cancer. Here, you get extremely tissue-specific diseases, okay? And this is something that we really don't understand at the moment. And we have some ideas of what might be going on. We're actually looking at this uh, in the lab. Uh, but this is, is very, very special about uh, this gene. So it's a very interesting gene. Okay, so going back to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the progeria. So progeria is a splicing disease, okay? So the mutation that causes this disease is a spontaneous point mutation in exon 11 um, of the laminase gene. It's a C2T transition, and this is actually a silent mutation. Uh, both of these encode for glycine, but what happens is that you activate the cryptic splice site inside of this exon. Uh, and activation of this cryptic splice site leads to elimination of 150 nucleotides from the end of exon 11. And because this is uh, 150 nucleotides and using the correct splice site here in the next exon, um, you're essentially creating a protein which has an internal deletion of 50 amino acids. Okay? So here is an RT-PCR where, where you can see the, um, the shortened RNA. It lacks 150 nucleotides. And here is now the product of this RNA, uh, this protein which we refer to as progerin, which lacks 50 amino acids um, internally. Now you can see that you also have in these patients normal laminae. You have full length laminae as well. And that is because this is a, sp a spontaneous point mutation and all the patients are heterozygous. So they have one normal gene and they have one um, mutant gene. And, and that's sufficient to give a disease phenotype. I should also say you see here lamin C and you'll see that on some of the other Western blots. So lamin C is a variant of lamin A which is, which is uh, generated by alternative splicing of the same gene. Uh, this terminates um, uh, um, upstream of, of exon 11, so is not affected in the disease, okay? Now, probably not surprisingly, because you have a mutation now in uh, one of the most important proteins uh, in the cell nucleus and in nuclear structure, nuclei of patients are, are severely affected. So these are skin fibroblasts from uh, patients uh, here at the bottom. And here are your controls. And you can see that there are, for example, structural defects. So the shape of these nuclei is completely different. Control uh, skin fibroblasts have very nice round nuclei. And here, uh, the shape of the nucleus is severely affected. You have these, these blobs, essentially, uh, sticking out and irregular shapes. Uh, but there's a lot more going on. Um, so for example, we have found that various proteins are degraded inside of the cell nucleus. Um, so, for example, lamin B, which is uh, a lamin A interacting protein, it's essentially its major interaction partner inside of the nucleus, um, is degraded in most cells. And this antibody here recognizes seven lamin-associated proteins. And again, you can see that these proteins are essentially have disappeared 
um, from these patient cells. And this is a, uh, this occurs at the protein level. This is not a transcriptional event, so, so we can check this. Uh, this seems to be increased protein degradation uh, of these proteins. Uh, other proteins which are degraded are uh, particularly chromatin proteins. Here, for example, heterochromatin protein 1, which is a marker protein for, for heterochromatin. It's a structural protein of heterochromatin. Uh, you need it, essentially, to make heterochromatin. It's degraded in these patient cells. The same is true for HMG proteins and also other chromatin proteins, including uh, linker histones. Um, also, we see dramatic um, epigenetic changes. Uh, so, for example, again, most, most drastically, uh, you get loss of trimethylation of lysine 9 on histone H3. And again, this is a mark of heterochromatin. Uh, others have reported other types of, of uh, epigenetic changes, including uh, lysine 20, lysine 27, um, and, and various other ones. Okay, so, so you get epigenetic modifications. And this is, this is quite striking now, actually. If you think about it, so because what we have here is a situation where you have a mutation in an architectural protein at the periphery of the nucleus, which affects the epigenetic status of your entire genome. Okay? And again, we're obviously trying to, to figure out uh, how that works and what the mechanism is. Now, probably as a consequence of all these changes, uh, you get massive structural changes in chromatin, particularly, this again is extremely striking in these cells, you get complete loss of heterochromatin. So, so morphologically, you cannot see heterochromatin in these cells, um, which, which I find quite remarkable. Uh, there's other things that, that go wrong. Uh, you start expressing things which you shouldn't express. Uh, for example, satellite 3 repeats. So satellite 3 repeats are, are essentially uh, pericentromeric regions which are normally not transcribed unless you stress cells. Here, for example, with heat shock, and you start uh, transcribing those. In progeria patient cells, we find that these are turned on all the time, which might actually su suggest that these cells are under some sort of chronic stress, uh, which is interesting because chronic stress has been implicated in the aging process. Um, and then also a very, very important uh, other hallmark is uh, increased DNA damage. So when you stain with, uh, this is an antibody which recognizes phospho-H2AX, which is a marker for, for double strand breaks, essentially, you always get increased uh, levels of persistent DNA breaks in these cells. Now, um, as I've already sort of told you, this progerian protein acts in a dominant fashion, okay? So, because it is heterozygous uh, and you have normal lamin A, uh, but introduction of this protein or the presence of this protein is essentially bad news for the cell. And you can show this uh, easily by, by doing a simple experiment where you take normal skin fibroblasts and you take GFP uh, um, progerin and you introduce it into cells and you can essentially recapitulate all the defects that you see in progeria patient cells. Okay? So introduction of the protein, the presence of the protein is bad news for these cells. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, so, so what, what, what's going on here molecularly? So we know a little bit of, of what we think goes on. And, and to explain that, I need to explain real quick how you make lamin A, the, the mature protein. So normally, lamin A is made as a pre-lamin molecule, okay? Um, and then there's a few um, modification steps that occur. And, and the only two important ones are the first one here, which is a farnesylation event. So you get uh, addition of a farnesyl group here at the C-terminus of, of the protein. There's a few other steps. And then you get the second important event, which is cleavage, an endoproteolytic cleavage of the protein, which releases this farnesylated C-terminus and gives rise to the mature lamin A. Okay? And this, we believe, happens in the nuclear interior, and this intermediate then moves to the periphery, and it is the, the protein then associates with the periphery, with the lamina, which is already there. Then you get the cleavage, and this mature protein is then incorporated into the, the meshwork of, of proteins, okay? Now, the mutant does exactly the same thing. You start off with this farnesylation, you get this intermediate, but now um, the, the problems start. And the problem is that, as I said, there's an internal deletion of 50 amino acids. And unfortunately, these 50 amino acids include this cleavage site. And so you can now not cut off the farnesylated um, C-terminus, 
And what, what essentially happens is you accumulate this farnesylated intermediate. And, and we and others have actually shown that this intermediate essentially associates and accumulates at the nuclear periphery. In the periphery, the lamina actually gets thicker. Okay? Um, so you're sort of piling up these molecules at, at the nuclear periphery. And we actually know that it's this intermediate, this farnesylated intermediate, that's really the problem in this disease. Okay? And there's, there's two reasons why, why we mainly think that. One is, if you make a mouse which lacks this enzyme, so you cannot cleave off the C-terminus, the farnesylated C-terminus, of the wild-type protein, that mouse has uh, premature aging symptoms. Okay? On the other hand, if you take cells, patient cells, and you treat them with farnesyl transferase inhibitors, so these are inhibitors which prevent the addition of this farnesyl group, the patient cells start looking perfectly normal again. So you reversed the disease phenotype, which suggests that it's really this farnesylation which does all the damage in these cells. And there are now actually, there are three clinical trials going on with farnesyl transferase inhibitors. Um, and, and I think the results are looking fairly promising. Uh, they're, they're not a complete cure of, of this disease, obviously, but um, I think um, that there's certainly a, a very exciting avenue of, of, of research. I also want to point out, because I know there are some people in the audience who, who work on, on HIV, um, it's, it's been interesting because it turns out that the proteases that are used in HIV treatment actually also have activity against this endoprotease. And one of the side effects that has been noted in patients on these um, HIV re uh, regimens is actually premature aging. Okay? And that's probably explained by interference with, with this uh, endoprotease. Okay, so the idea is essentially, this is sort of a very simplified model of what we think goes on, is that you're making uh, this mutant lamin A protein, this progerin protein, and it essentially accumulates at the nuclear periphery, and it, it then interferes with the function of the, the nuclear lamina, um, um, and, and that really then causes these uh, cellular defects. Okay, now, of course, that a key question here is, well, is any of this relevant to normal aging? Or is this just you know, relevant to these, these 50 patients that we know of in the world? Okay, so I said it's a rare disease, and that's, that's actually how rare it is. We know at the moment of about 50 or 60 patients. Now, we actually thought very early on that this might be relevant for, for normal aging as well. And that was just from looking at, at the sequence, essentially, where this mutation is located. So this is the, um, the mutation, the, the sequence around the, the mutation in the patients. And so this is essentially, uh, as many of you will recognize, essentially consensus uh, splice site. Okay? And that's why you activate this cryptic splice site. So uh, you essentially have one mismatch to, to a regular consensus splice site. Now, because this sequence is, is generated by point mutation, what that means is, well, the wild type, the sequence that we all have, um, has two mismatches to a consensus splice site. So, you know, that's, that splice site could maybe still be used, okay? So, so we hypothesized very early on that actually in normal healthy cells, you make low levels of this progerin protein at all times, okay? And um, that's indeed the case. So when you look by either PCR or uh, by Western blot, you can actually find uh, use of this cryptic splice site. So here we're using primers which specifically pick up this, um, the use of this cryptic splice site. And you can also find the protein, uh, here is this band in the middle, um, in both young and old healthy people, okay, normally aged people. And you can also do it um, by um, cytology, essentially. You can actually make an antibody against this protein, this progerin protein, and you can find uh, this protein in all sorts of tissues in perfectly healthy individuals. Now, this seems to be a bit of a problem because as I told you, this protein is dominant, okay? So having this protein is essentially bad news. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe the presence of this protein also does something during normal aging uh, and in, in healthy individuals. And what's interesting is what we actually found was that cells from healthy old individuals actually look very, very similar to cells from progeria patients, okay? 
So I showed you before that in progeria patients, um, the shape of the nuclei is different uh, from, from control cells. You lose these proteins, such as these LAP2 proteins, you lose HP1, you get changes in epigenetic modifications. And that is exactly what we see in um, normally aged, healthy individuals. You see loss of these proteins, changes in structure of, of the nucleus and loss of these proteins. Um, we also see increased DNA damage in cells from healthy individuals, just as we see in progeria patient cells. So there's a lot of parallels between normally aged cells and uh, progeria patient cells. Now, we can also show that the defects that we see in the normally aged cells are indeed really due to use of this cryptic splice site. Okay? And the way we do this is by using a method which we developed where we can actually block this cryptic splice site. So we developed a small oligonucleotide, which is complementary to this cryptic splice site. And when we introduced this oligonucleotide, we showed earlier that you can take patient cells, introduce the oligonucleotide, and these patient cells can essentially look like normal cells again. Okay? And so that's exactly what we did here with cells from normally aged individuals. Um, you can see that, as I said, they have loss of, for example, trimethyl K9, loss of HP1, and when you then treat these cells with the oligonucleotide, you reverse this. So you've essentially taken old cells and made them at least look like young cells again. All right? And they also behave like young cells because they, they, for example, start proliferating again, which old cells don't. And you can also reverse various um, signal transduction uh, defects that occur in old cells, particularly uh, in the P53 target gene. Um, uh, in, in p53 target genes, you can reverse those when you inhibit this, this cryptic splice site. Okay, so this this use of this cryptic splice site seems to be important uh, for giving rise to these um, defects that we see in normal aged individuals. So we're beginning to draw parallels between this premature aging disease, this very very rare premature aging disease, and uh, normal aging. So here we have. Uh, in the premature aging situation, we have fairly high levels of expression of this progerin protein over short periods of time, which leads to this dramatic premature aging um, phenotype. Whereas in normal aging, we have lower levels of the protein, maybe over longer periods of time, we think that contributes to the normal aging process as well. Now, I do want to make an important point and a clarifying point, and that is that we're not saying that this protein actually causes aging. Okay? But we think it triggers aging, which is a difference. Okay? And the way you can, uh, or the reason why we say this, is, is this observation here. And that is, um, so as I, as I alluded to before, I didn't show you the data though. Um, the lamin protein in the progeria patient cells accumulates at the nuclear periphery. Okay? So this is essentially what, what lamins usually look like. You have an accumulation at the periphery and then some, you have some signal in the interior. In progeria patient cells, you've lost this interior signal and all the lamin accumulates at the periphery. Okay? Now, in young cells, um, where we have low levels of progerin, there seems to be nothing wrong with it. Okay? But in old cells, where the level of progerin is actually the same, so we never saw an increase of the progerin levels with age. So here you have low levels of progerin as well, but now the lamin looks exactly like you see in the progeria patient cells. And so what this tells you is that the young cell can essentially deal with this bad protein, okay, the progerin protein, but the old cell cannot. So the difference between young and old is really not the level of progerin, it's how the cell responds to the progerin protein. And again, we're, we're currently trying to understand what that really means. You know, how is this protein recognized in the cell? And, and what, what, what does this protein really do to the cell? Okay, so this sort of tells you a little bit of, of, of what might be going on um, in, 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 these, in these cells. But, but the question still remains, is how does, how does the protein really do it? How does progerin really give rise to these cellular defects? So how does progerin lead to defects in, for example, chromatin structure? And then there's, there's the much bigger question of, well, how does progerin really give rise to these organismal defects? So why do these patients lose their hair? Why do they lose their fat um, tissues? Um, why are there skin abnormalities? All right. 
And so I'm going to tell you uh, two fairly brief stories um, on our efforts to try to, to understand that. The first one deals with uh, how progerin affects chromatin structure, and the second one is going to um, uh, deal with how progerin gives rise to these organismal defects. So let's first talk about chromatin structure. So as I, 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 as I told you, in these progeria patient cells, we have a whole range of, of defects in, in chromatin. Uh, so there are structural defects, there are epigenetic defects, there's uh, increased DNA damage, there's transcriptional activation. And when we first started thinking about this, we, we didn't really know, you know where to start looking. Uh, what pathways would you target? What pathway would you start working on to figure out what progerin really does? And um, we came up with a hypothesis um, which, because we thought, well, maybe what's really happening here is that progerin affects a single component in the cell, which is actually important or it's involved in various different chromatin pathways. Okay? So it's sort of an upstream um, component in, in chromatin maintenance. And um, so we looked around for a long time and sort of thought about possible candidates and what have you, and we came up with, with these two candidates, these two proteins, um, which are called RBP4 and 7. And these are histone chaperones. So these two proteins were first identified as RB interacting proteins. And what's interesting um, about these proteins, or what was interesting to us at the time, was that they are components of several chromatin maintenance complexes. Okay? So these two proteins are components of uh, what's called the PRC2 polycomb complex, which is essentially a, a silencing complex. Okay? They're also components of the NERD complex, which is a nucleosome remodeling complex, uh, which, is, uh, which has a histone deacetylase activity. And RBP4, at least, is a component of the CAF1 complex, which is chromatin assembly complex, which is important for, for assembling uh, chromatin after replication. Now, the other reason why we're interested in, in these two proteins, why they were good candidates, was because they had previously been biochemically fractionated with the nuclear lamina. So they seem to associate with, with the nuclear lamina. Um, then we also heard um, at a meeting that at least RBP4 interacts with lamina in a yeast 2 hybrid. So there seems to be physical interaction. And we then confirmed that uh, by immunoprecipitation, showing that both RPP4 and 7 actually do interact physically with lamina. So they bind to lamina. And interestingly, in vitro, we could actually show that the region which is missing in the progerin protein, these 50, these 50 amino acids, is actually important for this interaction. So uh, these two proteins interact in vitro with wild-type lamina, but they do not interact anymore with the progerin protein. So these, these were sort of a number of smoking guns that we were interested in. We thought like, well, maybe we should look at these proteins a little bit more, more closely. So we did, and we went into um, uh, progeria patient cells. And just like several other chromatin proteins, as I, as I mentioned, both of these proteins were essentially lost from progeria patient cells. So RBP4 is lost here in, in, in patient cells, and RPP7 is shown to be lost here, here by Western blot. Uh, so these proteins are essentially uh, gone from the patients. And again, this is a, not a transcriptional event. This occurs at the level of, of protein stability. Um, the loss of these two proteins was completely dependent on the presence of progerin. And so the way we could show this was by using a system where we can turn on progerin in an inducible fashion. Okay? And so when we do this, um, the cells here, so we're expressing GFP uh, progerin. Um, when, we express, when we turn on this, this progerin protein, you can now see that the cells which express the mutant protein, you lose RPP4 and you lose RPP7, whereas the cells which don't express it, you still see the proteins. So as soon as you have the protein in these cells, the uh, RPP4 and 7 proteins disappear. Okay, now um, obviously a simple prediction here is that if these two proteins are really important um, for, 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 for these changes that we see in progeria patient cells, you would predict that when you knock them out, you should see the same sort of defects that you see in progeria patient cells. Um, and, and that's exactly what we see. So when we, turn, when we um, um, knock down by RNAi, RPP4 and 7, we do this together. You now see loss of trimethyl K1. Um, 
And you also see, for example, activation of these uh, satellite three repeats. Now, this does not work if you only turn down, uh, uh, knock down one of these two proteins, because they're very similar proteins. There's a lot of redundancy in the system, so you really have to get rid of both of these proteins. Uh, you also get increased um, DNA damage. Um, so when you, again, knock down both of these proteins, you now start seeing phospho-H2x uh, foci very dramatically appearing in, in, um, in these cells. So you can essentially recapitulate uh, all the defects that you see in progeria patient cells by knocking down these two proteins. Okay, now, the question then, of course, is, well, which one of these complexes that these proteins are, are associated with is, in, is important for these, um, for these events? And we, we actually thought this would be all very, very difficult to work out, but it turned out to be easier than we thought because we, we did uh, simple Western blots, and what we found was that essentially all other components of the NERD complex were also lost in progeria patient cells. So HDAC1 is the catalytic subunit of the NERD complex. MTA3 is another component of the NERD complex. And just like RBP4 and 7, uh, they are uh, downregulated or degraded in progeria patient cells. And that's not the case for, for CAF components or PRC2 components. So essentially, it turns out that uh, the NERD complex disappears in these progeria patient cells. And not surprisingly, because the NERD complex disappears, uh, you lose histone deacetylase activity um, in these cells as well. So, if the NERD complex then is important for, for all of this, again, a prediction is that if you knock down the NERD complex, that's other components than RBP4 and 7, you should again see the same defects that you see in progeria patient cells. And so that's exactly what we did. We knocked down every single component of the NERD complex, and we could essentially show that this recapitulates again um, all the defects that we see in progeria patient cells. And we're just showing you um, here, oh, these are structural defects of chromatin, and here's DNA damage. So every time you knock down a NERD component, uh, you get increased DNA damage. And again, then the final question is, well, is this in any way important for normal aging? And we think it is because, and this is very difficult to see here, uh, but I'm just going to tell you that uh, these components of the NERD complex are essentially lost in cells from normally aged individuals. Okay? So again, we have this parallel between normal aging and premature aging. Okay, so what we think then happens is that the NERD complex, which we know is important for the maintenance of chromatin structure, um, interacts with the nuclear lamina under normal circumstances. Um, there's a lot that we don't understand about this interaction. Um, because, for example, if you localize the NERD complex, in contrast to lamin A, the NERD complex is sort of everywhere in the cell nucleus. It doesn't accumulate at the nuclear periphery. Okay, so it's not stuck at the nuclear periphery. And one model that we're thinking about is that the NERD complex essentially moves around, diffuses around in the nucleus. Once in a while, it will associate with the, with the periphery. And maybe its, its subunits or some of its subunits get uh, modified. And that then helps to stabilize this complex. Okay? Now, in the presence of, of progerin, uh, this interaction is affected. The NERD complex cannot interact with, with the lamina anymore, and this then leads to the degradation of the entire complex. And this then, of course, has consequences uh, because this complex is important for chromatin structure. You then get aberrant heterochromatin, uh, you get epigenetic changes, you get the satellite 3 expression, and eventually you get DNA damage. And we actually know we've done time course experiments where we've knocked down uh, um, RBP4 and 7, or we've turned on progerin, then it, done a time course, we actually know that these events happen before we see DNA damage. Okay, so DNA damage is really the, the most downstream effect of all of these. Um, and we still don't know how you get from here to there. Uh, so it could be that because you're changing epigenetic modifications and you're changing chromatin structure, that this increases the, the susceptibility of the genome for damage. So you're just accumulating more damage. Uh, or this could also be a replication defect. And again, that's something we're, we're currently very interested in. OK, so, so this is, is our current working model for, for uh, how chromatin defects come about in, in these um, disease cells. All right, so what about the, the second question then? Uh, and that is, how does progerin really give rise 
to these, these very dramatic organismal symptoms. Okay? Uh, because you know, we're, we're dealing here with a protein which is it's present in, in just about every nucleus in, in the body, um, and you have these fairly tissue-specific effects. Okay? And this is not, again, not an easy question to address. And the way we did it uh, was in a sort of not very imaginative way by doing uh, microarrays. Okay? So what we essentially did was we generated a system where we could turn on the progerin protein um, in, in cells in a very controlled fashion. And we turned it on. We expressed it for, uh, at low levels, similar to what you see in patient cells for either five or 10 days, and then we did microarray analysis and basically asked, is there anything interesting that, that you know, would sort of make sense? Um, so I'm not a big fan of, of microarray experiments, but you know, sometimes it actually does work. So <laughs> and it gives you sort of a good, a good idea of where to look. Anyway, so, uh, and of course, what you find in micro, in, as in most microarray experiments, you find upregulation of a few hundred genes and downregulation of a few hundred genes, and then you've got to go and sift through the data and hope to find something interesting. And we think we found something interesting. And, and the interesting thing was that we found activation of a group of genes which are downstream targets of a signal transduction pathway called the notch pathway. Okay? Now, the notch pathway is a very, very prominent signal transduction pathway, uh, which generally starts with a plasma membrane receptor. Uh, which is a transmembrane receptor. And this receptor or this pathway can be activated generally by cell-to-cell -cell contact. Okay? And so when this, this um, receptor is activated, there's an endoproteolytic cleavage which occurs, which cleaves off the cytoplasmic tail of this receptor. And this cytoplasmic part of the receptor then translocates into nucleus and it binds to various target genes. And the prototypical target genes are HES genes and HE genes. And these then, of course, these are transcription factors, and then they, they unleash a whole cascade um, of, of uh, transcriptional responses in the nucleus. So what we found was that when we turned on the progerin protein, um, a, a number of these target genes were um, upregulated in, um, by microarray. And this is then confirmed here by, by PCR in patient cells. So here is HES1, which is upregulated in, in four patient cells. HE1 upregulated as well, and we've tested a few other genes, and they're all upregulated. Okay, now, this is not a general activation of the pathway, okay? Um, so we're essentially, what's happening in these cells is that we're activating these target genes, but we're not activating the upstream part of the, of the pathway. And the reason why we, th we think that um, is, first of all, there's a, there's a whole bunch of um, gene products which are important for the processing and the cleavage um, of, of the <coughs> cytoplasmic tail. And those are not affected in, in our microarrays. But more importantly, we could, in our uh, progeria patient cells, never find this cytoplasmic fragment of the receptor. Okay? And that's shown here. So if you, if you use an antibody which, which um, is supposed to detect this cleaved notch a receptor, you simply cannot find it in the progeria patient cells. So, so what we think happens is that by interfering, by changing the lamina down here, um, we're activating these target genes in a very direct fashion. All right? Now, um, and yeah, so we don't know how, how this actually um, occurs, okay? What's, what's exactly going on down, downstream there? But here's, here's a I think an interesting possibility, but it, it's fairly speculative at this point. And a hint as, as what might be going on comes from a protein called the SKIP. So SKIP is an activator of these notch target genes. Okay? And what we found is that SKIP in a, in a control cell associates with the nuclear periphery with the lamina here. There's a little bit in the interior, but most of it is at the periphery. In progeria patient cells, this, um, this fraction of the molecules uh, which is associated with the periphery is essentially lost and is now in the interior of the nucleus. So, so the, the simple model is that in a wild type, you have the sequestration that I referred to earlier of, of this transcription factor skip. Um, whereas then when you interfere with the structure of, of the lamina, this falls essentially off and the protein is now free to act on, on genes in the nucleoplasm. Okay? 
So this, this relates to this sequestration <coughs> behavior of, of transcription factors. So that's one possibility. Anyway, so the reason why we're really interested in the notch signaling pathway to start with is because notch is really important for uh, differentiation, development, and particularly for stem cell differentiation. Okay, so notch has been implicated in both maintenance of stem cells, uh, particularly adult but also embryonic stem cells, and then in making decisions as to what lineage these cells go into and how, how fast and in what direction they proliferate. And the reason why this was interesting was because we noticed that many of the tissues, almost all of the tissues that are affected in progeria patient cells come developmentally from the same place, and that's the mesenchyme, okay? So all these tissues are <coughs> derived from the mesenchyme. And so we started thinking that, well, maybe progerin affects particularly mesenchymal stem cells, because if you then affect these mesenchymal stem cells, you would expect defects uh, in all these various tissues derived from the stem cell, from the mesenchymal stem cells. And so we, we um, introduced progerin into human mesenchymal stem cells and asked whether progerin has any effect on those cells. And the answer is yes. And in fact, there's two different things. First of all, when you look at undifferentiated human mesenchymal stem cells, you see that they're actually not really undifferentiated anymore. These undifferentiated human mesenchymal stem cells, when they express progerin, start expressing various tissue-specific lineage markers. Um, for example, here is a, um, um, a neuronal marker, um, a nesting, which, which is beginning to be expressed in a subpopulation of cells. But there's, there's a whole uh, range of other markers which are expressed as well. And so, th so this is, so the cells look morphologically not like neurons or differentiated cells. They look pretty much like mesenchymal stem cells, but they're beginning to express things which they really shouldn't express. So they're compromised in their stem cell potential, essentially. The second thing they do, the se second defect that we see in these cells is that their differentiation behavior is now affected. So when we take cells, mesenchymal stem cells, which express progerin, and we then drive them in, vivo, in vitro um, along various lineages into differentiation, we see dramatic effects. So for example, we see that bone differentiation, o osteogenesis, is dramatically enhanced in the presence of progerin. Okay, so these cells uh, essentially start, prolif or start differentiating almost spontaneously um, along the, the um, osteogenesis um, lineage. On the other hand, and this is very interesting, uh, considering the defects that we see in the patients, is that adipogenesis is essentially blocked in these cells when they express progerin. So clearly, uh, progerin leads to fairly dramatic um, mesenchymal stem cell differentiation defects. So what we're essentially then saying is that notch, which usually is important for stem cell differentiation and for determining lineage, uh, differentiation from, from mesenchymal stem cells um, is affected in progeria patient cells. So the downstream targets of this notch pathway are upregulated, as I showed you. This interferes with the behavior of the undifferentiated mesenchymal stem cells, and it also leads to differentiation defects. And this eventually leads to defects in tissue homeostasis, which, of course, then leads uh, to aging um, um, uh, phenotypes. So what we're really saying is that uh, this aging, uh, the, the aging symptoms that we see in the patients, and we'd like to suggest that that's also true in normal aging, has really something to do mis with misexpression of, of cell fate regulators like these notch target genes, and this then affects the regeneration of various tissues, and that then of course leads to aging. And in our case, we think this is all triggered by altered nuclear architecture, because of course that's what we're doing in the progeria patient cells. That's what we're doing in these experiments where we turn on, where we introduce progerin. Okay, that's the first thing we do. Um, now, of course, we don't know at this point, and I alluded to this, how we get from altered nuclear architecture to misexpression of these cell fate regulators. So one possibility that I suggested is that it might have something to do with the sequestration of these transcription factors, but there's obviously um, other models as well. And, and again, that's something we're very interested in at the moment. Now, what's interesting is that this sequence of events is actually very, very similar to what people are thinking about now in 
uh, the aging field per se, uh, what people have seen by looking at, at uh, various systems, where there's now a very, very strong link between stem cell defects and aging. And the, uh, the idea is, in a way, a very simple one, where you say, well, you know, aging is partially due to the fact that you cannot regenerate tissues properly. And so if you obviously have stem cell defects, well, then you can't regenerate tissues. And so stem cells uh, and the behavior of stem cells contributes uh, to the aging process. But it, but it certainly fits quite nicely with, with the, the sort of observation that we've made. Um, and so again, I just want to point out that uh, we're seeing these uh, parallels between this premature aging, this very rare disease, uh, this very rare premature aging disease that we've been studying, and the normal aging process. And so basically, I think we're slowly coming to the point uh, where we can begin to, to sort of connect the dots in this whole story, where we start out with a genetic defect, which we know leads to nuclear defects. We're beginning to characterize the cellular defects that uh, take place in these cells. We're moving on to tissues, and we're beginning to think about what happens phenotypically at an organismal level. And there's just two, two sort of uh, quick comments that I want to make to finish off. Uh, the first one is that a lot of the, the, the sort of um, key keywords here that I've mentioned also remind at least us, because I, I work at the National Cancer Institute, they remind, of, remind us of cancer. Um, and obviously aging is often considered sort of the flip side of cancer. And the two are, are really quite closely linked. And I think it brings us to what I think is one of the most important questions, both in the field of aging and in the field of, of cancer. And that is, how are the two really related? Because we all know that cancer is essentially a disease of old age. If you live long enough, you know, you will develop a cancer. Uh, that's, that's pretty sure. And, and the, uh, the incident of cancer increases dramatically uh, sort of in midlife. Okay, so there's clearly a connection there. And nobody knows what that connection really is. What's the molecular basis uh, for this age dependence of cancer formation? And I would actually argue the, um, the progeria system that we're working on is actually a very interesting model system uh, to look at that. And again, we're, we're, we're working on that in the lab. And the other point that, that I just want to make uh, to, to finish off is that everything I've told you from the gene discovery um, to, to the latest result has happened in essentially um, six years, okay? And we've gone from the gene discovery in 2003 to the first clinical trial, uh, which was started with these farnesyl transferase inhibitors in four years, which is probably a world record. Um, and the reason why that was possible is, is very, is, is, I think is a very important one. The reason why this was possible was because when the gene was identified as lamin A, we had this huge, this wealth of information on the, sort of the basic properties of lamin A because people had studied lamin A for about 20 or 30 years, okay? And so when this gene was identified as, as, as lamin A, we essentially could, could tap right into that huge knowledge, this basic knowledge um, of lamin A biology and devise a clinical trial very, very rapidly. And I think that's something we're gonna see more and more uh, in the future as we're identifying more disease genes. And I think the final point that I want to make is I think what it really tells you is that you should never stop doing basic science, ba basic biology, because all the, the knowledge that you're accumulating by studying obscure things will most likely probably come in very handy uh, sooner or later as people identify disease genes. All right, so then finally, I want to acknowledge the people who, um, who did all the work. Um, and, and of course, I'm, I, I could have given, so we work on, on a number of things in my lab. I could have given a completely gif different talk to you. Of course, I talked about this because all the work was done by two Italians in my lab. Um, one is uh, Paolo, Scafidi, Paolo Scafidi, who started this work um, in uh, 2004 or so, when she was a postdoc. She's now a staff scientist in my lab. And then, of course, Gianluca Pegoraro, who many of you probably know here, he was a student here. Uh, he's done an outstanding job on, on the chromatin connection with HTPS. Um, and he's now moved on to, um, to slightly different projects where he does high throughput screening. Um, and he will do extremely well on those projects as well, I have no doubt. And then finally, I want to um, thank a few collaborators here. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.